Welcome and good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Blazik. I am with Eagles Environmental Support Division. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's public hearing. Uh, thank you all for logging in tonight. And this public hearing is for a proposed revetment at 4909 Oak Lane, Lake Township in Berrien County. Uh, but before we go ahead and get started with the meeting or the hearing rather, uh, introducing our other Eagle um, speakers today, I'm going to go through uh, just a few logistics, logistical items and uh, an agenda, which you'll see on your screen. Uh, so we're doing the introduction right now. And this way this public hearing is going to work, it's going to have two parts. The first part is going to be an informational session. So the applicant is going to have an opportunity to present the proposed project, which shouldn't go longer than around 10 minutes. And that'll be followed by a question, question and answer session where you'll be able to ask questions, uh, general questions related to the application and project, uh, which should go to around 6.30. Uh, and then after 6.30, we'll move on to the second part of the public hearing tonight, which is the official hearing. Uh, we'll first though, go through some ways to make an official comment. If you don't wanna make uh, a comment at the official hearing tonight, uh, and that hearing, this, the, way, the way this hearing works is you'll have an opportunity to give an official comment that's for the record related to this application. I'll also talk about where to find other information and then who to contact with further questions on this project. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Zoom platform, all lines are muted during the hearing tonight. Uh, so you can hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. You'll be able to submit your questions during the question and answer session using the question box in the Zoom toolbar, which will be at the bottom of your screen. You also have an opportunity, you can ask questions by raising your hand, uh, but we'll go through how to do that later on when we get to that point. We're also recording this hearing, so uh, it will be available, a recording will be available on our YouTube channel and you'll receive an email with a link in a few days to that recording. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'd like to invite our Eagle staff, Zach Chamberlain, Zach Chamberlain and Kyle Alexander to uh, go ahead and introduce themselves. Hey everyone, good evening and thanks for being here. I'm uh, Zach Chamberlain, I'm an environmental quality analyst in the uh, Water Resources Division in the Kalamazoo office and I uh, administer the Critical Dune Area, High Risk Erosion and Great Lakes Bottomlands programs in Berrien County. Yeah, and I'm Kyle Alexander. I'm the District Supervisor for the Water Resources Division. And I work uh, with Zach out of the Kalamazoo District Office. All right, thank you both uh, for those introductions. We're gonna go ahead and get started then. So as, as mentioned, the first part of this public hearing tonight will be the presentation by the applicant followed by the question and answer session. So what we'll do is we will uh, locate Miss um, uh, Susanna Deneau, who should be in our list of participants tonight. I'm here. Oh, I can hear you, yep. Right. Uh, you're, unmute you're unmuted, thanks for calling in tonight, Susanna. Um, I have your presentation here. So the way that we'll work this is just uh, let me know when you need to advance a slide and I'll advance it for you. Um, and again, uh, for the sake of time, uh, you know, please try to keep it to about 10 minutes. I think I'm gonna be less than that. So thank you okay. so much. Uh, I'm Susanna Denno with Whiteman Associates. I've been asked by the applicant to present tonight. Um, go ahead and go to the first slide. So just want to give you a little bit of history. Um, as many of us know, we've had some very high lake levels in the last um, couple of years. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like on this property from the edge of water in 2006 to the front face of the house, it was approximately 310 feet. Um, and in 2019, we had another survey done and it was 147 feet. So as a, as a homeowner, that's a pretty drastic change in one I think probably several people on the phone um, have witnessed themselves. Um, in the late fall, late fall uh, of 2020, temporary sandbags were installed for um, an intermed intermediate measure. Um, and since then, the good, good news is that the water levels have dropped and, and we have more of a beach since those have been installed. 
Um, and while we're on this slide, I did speak to the homeowner and his intention as of right now is to not install the revetment that we are getting permitted, but rather he would like to have a uh, fail safe plan in place in case something does change in the next five years, for instance. Um, his intention is that we use these sandbags and when it's time to take those out, then we take those out. Uh, next slide. So this is a cross section of what was proposed. Um, it was part of the, the plan set that probably most of you looked at. Um, as of right now, um, we are looking to use that existing uh, profile of uh, the bluff itself and tried to match in as close as possible. So we're not digging a lot of extra sand out. Um, we are digging at the toe below grade to approximately uh, eight, or oh, sorry, 580.0 uh, for the toe of the um, revetment itself, trying to get really close to that ordinary high water mark. Um, and then the top of the revetment matches in with slope, which is about uh, 602 to 604, depending on which section of the property you're on. Um, this revetment is a little bit, uh, it's proposed a little bit differently than most of the other ones that I've been involved in. Um, instead of using a traditional limestone, which is what um, we have readily available in our area, we're looking at Kutani and basalt type of rocks. These are found, um, actually I can have you switch to the next page when you're ready. Um, th this is what they look like. These are found um, in the um, Northwest in Montana. And um, there's a couple of reasons why the owner likes these better is they're not quite as vividly white as the limestone is. And they can be a little bit more manicured, maybe is the right word, um, as they're being placed. I think more, more ledges can be placed in there. Um, they are both natural stones that are found that are resistant to freeze thaw, which is a concern that we would have for this type of project. But those are the two pictures of the two different types of stones. Um, neither one has been solidified as that's the one we're going to use or if it would be a mix of them. Um, again, the, the homeowner in this case is not interested in putting in a revetment unless it's absolutely necessary to protect his investment. Next slide. I think that maybe is one more. Yep. So we had done one um, render, rendering. It's, it's a little tough to, uh, picture that as being the property that we're speaking of. Uh, there's a lot more trees in this area, as many of you will know, um, but we were trying to give an idea of, of what it would look like if we use that type of stone in lieu of a traditional uh, limestone revetment. Um, and that is the end of the information that I had to present today. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing that information, Susanna. Um, so, and with that, uh, we'll move into the question and answer uh, portion um, of tonight's hearing. And again, uh, at kind of after this portion, we'll move into the portion where you'll be giving your statement for the record. This first part is gonna be specifically for question and answers uh, related to the project. And so you can submit your question by using the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. You can also click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen that you'll see. And if we, it looks like we do have someone on the phone. So if you're on the phone and would like to ask a question, you can select pound two and it will raise your virtual hand in the Zoom platform and we'll be able to call on you um, at that point to ask your question. Uh, and so the way we'll work this is I'll ask the question and then, um, you know, Zach or Kyle can uh, answer the question as appropriate or potentially uh, direct to Susanna um, if it's appropriate for her to answer. So the first question, okay. I actually don't have a typed in question yet, but I do have a hand raised. So uh, Shelly, um, gonna go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question or Jim. And I should mention that Jim Ostrowski with Eagles Environmental Support Division is also on the line and is going to be helping in the background in case you hear his voice. But uh, Suzanne, um, Shelly, it looks like, looks like you're unmuted on our end. So you'll just have to unmute yourself and then you can ask your question.
I have no question. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so what we'll do is unmute you. It looks like your hand was raised. Uh, it looks like Stacy Stein has her hand raised. So we will move on to Stacy. Yes, um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Wonderful. The question I have is, is there a time within which um, a petitioner must pursue the permit? I mean, they pursued a permit if it's granted, isn't there a time within which they must implement the revetment or is it open-ended? They've indicated in the commentary that it would be, um, they would just want that flexibility of the next five years. You can answer that from, I guess, Eagle's perspective. If a permit were to be issued for the project, it would be in effect for five years from the date of issuance. So they would have a five-year period to uh, to utilize the permit. Um, if they did not utilize it within that five-year period, they would have to reapply for a new permit. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Stacy. All right, looks like now we have some that are uh, that are coming in that were typed in. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through some of these. Um, so the first question is, I am unclear on whether the applicant is committing to maybe pronouncing this incorrectly, Kootenai and basalt, or is limestone still an option? Is the, and there's a second part, I guess, is the applicant seeking approval based on the Kootenai and basalt options, in other words? I'm going to go ahead and answer that, as Susanna. Uh, you are correct. The Kutani and basalt, I had to look up the pronunciations of both those words. Um, just now also, and that is what we are requesting a permit for. Um, I don't know if that would be a stipulation of the permit, but that is the intention of the client that we would do something that is um, non-limestone, but still a natural stone if needed. Okay, thank you for the question and answer. And then um, this is kind of a similar, I guess, along the similar lines related to the stone. All revetment issues aside, is it a smart idea to bring in that much stone that is so different from anything else, anything naturally occurring in our area? Um, so I don't know if we can interpret can, that any further. But. I can start answering, and then if Susanna has something to add from their um, perspective, she can jump in. Um, in all of pretty much Southwest Michigan, there's very little exposed bedrock. Everything is an unconsolidated sediment on the surface. So any type of stone that you bring in, regardless of if it's limestone or a basalt or a sandstone or what have you, is gonna be very different than the uh, naturally occurring conditions at the lake shore. Okay. Zana, if you have anything to uh, add from the applicant's perspective. I'm that was sure. actually going to be my answer. And um, quantity wise, I don't know if you want to address that one or if it was really just about the type of stone. It's, uh, she doesn't say specifically about the type of stone. Okay. Uh, or it doesn't specifically say quantity. Okay. Just on wh whether the applicant is committing to um, those types, or is limestone still an option? Or no, I'm sorry, is a smart idea to bring that much, oh, it is so that much stone that is so different. So I guess there are two parts of it. Is a smart idea to bring that much stone that are so different? Sure, and so I can talk a little bit about the quantity. So the, the quantity is pretty similar to, to how we would design many of the other types of projects using limestone or a different type of stone. Um, I think we just lost Susanna. Ah. Oh, there we are. There I am. So sorry about that. Um, I think I stopped at the right point. Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking to protect the bluff from both a high water condition and a low water condition storm events. And that's where that quantity of stone comes from is the, the length of his project times the, the, um, both the height and the, the, the high point and the low point. Um, that would come out of it. So that's where the, the magic number comes into play. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is, why doesn't Eagle put the application and then uh, on hold indefinitely? Because the property owner views this as a fail safe plan and because water levels are decreasing. Take that. 
Um, so Eagle, when we're reviewing an application such as the one we're here for tonight, um, we can only put an application on hold if there is, um, for example, a violation on the site that we didn't know about, or there is an incomplete application. So we need additional information before we can make a final assessment. Um, other than that, we are statutorily obligated to review an application within the deadline set forth um, by the uh, NREPA. Thank you both for the question and answer. The next question is, uh, what is EGLE's assessment of the design from an engineering perspective in terms of effectiveness? It looks like it may function more like a seawall. So I can take that one as well. Um, so we are still um, somewhat early in the review process. We will be looking into these questions a bit more during things like the special exception review process under part 353. Um, and um, once we get all your guys' comments and uh, concerns, we will uh, be going through um, each criteria in the law um, to make a final determination. And um, during the uh, statement here in a little bit, you'll have a better idea of what those criteria are. Gotcha, thanks. I actually have a, and maybe you can elaborate it, oh, any further if needed, but I think you just touched on this. If the permit is granted, what specifically would make a revetment necessary and who would, return, who would determine that the revetment is necessary? So, so just yeah, I can elaborate just a little bit more. Um, because this is a sand dune, critical sand dune area and it is a new structure like we're of the crest, we are um, going to be going through the special exception process. And as part of that, we will determine things like the distance of the existing home to the erosion hazard line and um, how human health and safety may be affected if a special exception is not granted. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, would the project approval be dependent on a deterioration of the situation given, app given applicant agrees the revetment is currently not necessary? Who would make the determination that deterioration has occurred to a point that is essentially an irreversible, irreversible project that might be justified? So projects um, that are reviewed by EGLE can only be approved if they meet the applicable criteria found in the specific statute we are reviewing it under. So in this case, it is the uh, part 325, which is the Great Lakes Submerged Lands, and part 353, the Sand Dunes Protection and Management. Um, those are really the criteria found in there. And as I said before, we will uh, outline those for you here in a little bit, are what we must use to make our decision. Okay. Um, next question is, is the revetment to protect the structure slash dwelling slash home or the septic system? So is the revetment, is it to protect the structure or dwelling, dwelling or home? Dwelling is structure slash dwelling slash home or the septic system? Pass that one off to Susan. Sure, thank you for that. Um, in this case, it would be all of the above. All right. Zach, we had a couple of comments about having difficulty hearing you, so you might need to speak up just a little bit. Okay. Uh, all, the, all the revetment issues aside, how much damage to the sand and beach underwater in front of the property would the barging in process cause? Susanna, do you want to describe kind of the process for installation? Sure, absolutely. So in this case, um, I believe, or at least the last time I was on site, there was still a tree or two that was laying on the beach. Those would need to be removed just, just for access. Um, but the access would mostly come from the top or from a barge. And in the case of our project, what we'd be trying to do is excavate at the toe. And it was, uh, the dimensions are roughly uh, three to six feet, depending on the size of the stone that would, the first toe stone that would be installed, um, that would relatively, most of them I think would be buried. Some of them might be a little bit taller than, than our um, excavation hole. Um, once those are in, then there'd be very little excavation to the bluff. It would only be the, the sections that are, are exceeding the, um, the proposed slope of, um, that we show on the plans. Uh, 
And, you know, if there's any root balls or something that would be in the way that would need to be removed in order to install a rock, then we would go ahead and do that. But, but really the intention is to not disturb very much of that slope. Um, we're trying to, trying to match in as much as we can. And then at either end of the property, um, there would be a little bit of a, a rounded edge tying back in to protect um, the, the stones from being un, uh, undermined from, from the next door property, for lack of a better description. Trying to protect both properties, we would round it towards each side and try to prevent that from happening. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. There's also, uh, I have another question that somewhat piggybacks on that. It's related to the dimensions um, of the project. It says, again, for clarification, is it correct that the height of the stone would be approximately 25 feet from the uh, 580 foot lake level? And then also, what is the east to west dimension? I.e., how many feet back does this go? And they're trying to get a sense of the angle. So I'm not sure if you can provide any. Sure, sure I can. And I don't know if we can go backwards to that cross section if we can. A lot of those answers are on it. Um, I, okay. I can attempt to do that. That's... Got it. Okay, so if you, I don't know if we can zoom in, but it's really the, the width varies 22 to 37 feet. We're trying to, again, match in to this existing slope as much as we can. Um, and the elevation change is 602 to 604 within that range. Um, again, trying to match into that existing uh, slope that's there. And that varies between a one on two to a one on three, depending on where you're at. And then the length of it, I don't know if we talked about, was it the length along the property? It's the entire property or width, I should say, the entire property width. Um, as far as the width goes, if you're looking toe of revetment to top of revetment, that's that 22 to 37 feet. Okay, thanks for providing, providing clarification on that. And I'll leave this slide up for a little bit for people interested. Um, and then uh, I have a question asking um, related to the house, the distance from the house from the bluff. How far is the house from the bluff? And is the home actually threatened? Uh, please clarify. Sure. Uh, as of 2019, uh, the distance from the furthest lakeward part of the house to the water's edge was 147 feet. Um, at this point in time, I would agree that the house is not being threatened. I think the concern was when we started this process that the lake was continuing on an upward trend, and there was concern. As you can see from this detail, um, there's a nice lower, we call it the lower patio fire pit area in there. And that, that's a buff, bu slight buffer zone to where the house will be up on this uh, slightly higher area. And if that was starting to be eroded, that's when the house would be at risk um, because the toe of the slope would be, um, uh, the, the, the toe of the slope that would protect the house would be at, be at lake level. Uh, so that's when we started this project. I know that's not exactly the conditions at this moment in time, which is one reason why uh, the sandbags made a lot of sense and we were able to use those. And then also the intention is that unless things get drastically worse and mash more of 2020 conditions, it's unlikely that we're going to proceed forward with the revetment. Okay, thank you for that answer. Uh, just to let everyone know, I think I mentioned it before, we're going to try to wrap up the Q&A session at around 6.30. Still have questions here, and we still have some time to get through them. Just want to let people know where we're at. And then also, uh, we, have, we have someone on the phone. Uh, if you're on the phone and would like to ask a question, feel free to hit pound two um, to raise your hand um, and ask your question. Uh, so the next question, I believe, is for more for Kyle and Zach, but it's after tonight's hearing, what are the next procedural steps? Take that one. Um, hopefully you can hear me a bit better. Um, so after tonight, we, there will be an additional 10 days in which Eagle will take public comments. Um, once we receive all comments, and that date is uh, July 1st, we will review those comments, um, and then we will take the application to a special exception panel where it will be reviewed under the criteria found in the uh, sand dunes protection and management portion of the NREPA. 
Um, and then from there, we will make a determination whether to approve the project, um, um, recommend a modification of the project or denial of the project. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, at the moment, and as is a usual condition, are there many, or there are many layers of shallow sandbars well offshore? Wouldn't these need to be aggressively disturbed to gain access? And then what is Eagles and the Army ACOE, Army Corps Engineers position on breaching sandbars in this way? I can uh, try to answer that one. So I can't speak for the Army Corps of Engineer, but um, for Eagle, it would require the authorization under part 325, which is the Great Lakes submerged lands. And we would um, view it as a temporary impact um, the assumption being there that once the barge has left, the uh, high wave energy within the littoral zone would cause the sand to become reworked and the bars to reform. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is related to a distance. Okay, so the question is, it appears there is quite a distance from even the high water mark from this past year to the home, um, what is the distance? And to the first structure, which the homeowner has concerns, shed, septic, or home? And I think that part was answered. Um, and, and then, uh, let's see. And then another comment really, and this is just a lot, this is a long question, so I'm trying to, uh, and then does it make sense to approve this when water levels are dropping? So I guess just to kind of recap, like they're mentioning it appears to be a distance from the high water mark uh, to the home, what the distance is, um, and then to the first structure, which the homeowner has a concern, a shed septic home, and doesn't make sense to approve this when water levels are dropping. So that's kind of a three part. I think, I can, I think yeah, go ahead, Susanna. I'll just take the first one, which is the distance is the closest distance is the home. Um, the septic system is not uh, lakeward of the house. It's actually off to the side and back a little bit. So it is not the, the first structure. It's the home itself. And it's 147 feet in 2019 when we measured it. And in terms of that second portion of the question there, um, does it make sense to approve this when water levels of dropping? Um, I think I said it before, um, Eagle is obligated to review these applications under the um, statute or under this to the criteria found in the applicable statute. So in this case, part 325, Great Lakes Submerged Lands and part 353, Sand Dunes Protection. Um, and as part of that, we do take into account things like the impact to human health and safety um, and the uh, relative need of the structure. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a hand raised, so let's go ahead and move to a raised hand of Arthur Hahn, or Han. Uh, looks like you're unmuted on, on our end. You can go ahead and ask a question. Thank you. My question was answered. Thanks. Okay. Thank you much. Um, another question is, so we're gonna go back to the questions that people typed in. Um, does the saving of structures warrant the permanent destruction of shoreline? So I guess, um, I don't know if you can talk to um, yeah, I factors. Think, I think Zach addressed that uh, with a couple of his previous answers, which yeah. really is, you know, when, when we're determining whether or not to issue a permit for one of these projects, you know, that decision is gonna be based kind of entirely on the statute that are laid out for us. Um, or in, based on entirely on the criteria that are laid out for us in statute, which in this case would be the critical dune law. Gotcha, and just to piggyback on that, I, one question in here does relate to the criteria when this, does the homeowner have a criteria when this might be necessary? So it sounds like you had kind of just touched on that. Yeah, and I think Susanna uh, maybe answered that question okay. uh, already as well. All right, one is, uh, question is related to the rendering. Um, the rendering looks very different from the drawing. Very roughly placed versus very neat. They're asking which is right, which is correct, which drawing. Sure. 
um, I can answer that. The intention is much more along the lines of the rendering. What you're seeing in a cross section is a single point in the, the entire cross section. So it's a lot harder to show uh, that there's a little bit of uh, irregularity in the stones. The point is on this detail though, that there would not be a, a single part that would not be um, unprotected by stone from, from one height to the, to the other height. Um, you may not see them because they might just end up being buried in sand, depending on how they get placed. But but uh, the irregularity is part of one of the things that we are trying to achieve with this project. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we uh, still have quite a few questions, uh, but let's try to wrap up with maybe just another... Say. Ryan, I think a lot of the remaining questions I've been scrolling through them have to deal with the distance from the structure of the house to the edge of water now versus in 2019. And since I know we're short on time, I'll, I'll just kind of try and wrap all of those into one answer, which is um, Eagle, Zach, myself, when we're reviewing uh, the application and considering it, we're, we're aware of what the distance uh, or the conditions were in 2019 when the applicant submitted, and we're also aware of what the conditions are are now. So, um, yeah, I guess that's just to say we're very aware of what the current conditions are, and and both of those things will be taken into consideration when we're making our decision. Thank you, Kyle, for for wrapping that up. Um, there's one more on here I'd like to touch on before we move on to the hearing part because um, I don't think it has been touched on yet. It says relative to human safety in part 325, what are Eagle's responsibilities for protecting public health of public trust beach walkers? So I can take that. So under part 325, it is found in the administrative rules. It's rule 15. It requires Eagle or the applicant to deter, to positively demonstrate that impacts to the public trust adjacent riparians and the environment will be minimal. All right, thank you, Kyle. Or Zach. Um, we are uh, going to wrap up because we're past 6.30 and it looks like we got to most of the questions. Um, and Kyle did a nice job of, of kind of wrapping together some of those. We're going to move on to the public hearing portion. Um, this way we can also give everyone a chance to make their official statement for the record. And this will be the part that you'll have an opportunity to do that. But if uh, you're not prepared to do that tonight, there are other ways that you can sub submit an official comment. One is through My Waters uh, on the link that you'll see on your screen. Another is by mail uh, to Zach Chamberlain. Uh, and I'll read the email off uh, for those who are on the phone. C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-I-N-Z at michigan.gov. Um, or by mail, that's to Eagle Water Resources Division, Kalamazoo Dif District Office, 7953 Adobe Road, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 49009. And uh, I think believe Zach mentioned this before, the comment period after this public hearing will be open for 10 days, which is July 1st. So with that, I'd like to invite Zach to give the uh, opening statement for tonight's hearing portion. Thanks, Brian. So if you guys have uh, been with us before one of these um, public hearings, you know we have to read this quite long um, introduction, so just bear with us here. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Zach Chamberlain, and I am the District Representative in the Water Resources Division of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, also known as EGLE. I will be serving as the hearing officer for this public hearing. Other Eagle Water Resource Division staff present tonight are my supervisor, Kyle Alexander, you've already met, and I believe um, Field Operations Section Manager, Luis Saldivia is also online. To describe how this is going to work tonight, I will begin with some background information about why we are here. I will then describe the purpose of the hearing and how your comments will be used. Following that, I will outline the procedure, procedures under which we will take your comments and then describe what will happen after tonight's hearing. It will then be time for you to provide your comments and we will spend the majority of the time tonight listening to those comments. At the end of the hearing, I will provide a short summary and closing. By way of background information, the Water Resources Division is responsible for administering a variety of programs that help protect inland lakes and streams, wetlands, floodplains, sand dunes, and the Great Lakes. 
These programs regulate certain activities such as dredging or filling a lake, stream or wetland, constructing a dam, constructing a marina, placing shore protection or constructing docks, and building in a designated critical sand dune area, wetland, or floodplain. The law governing those responsibilities is the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act 1994 PA 451 as amended, also known as Act 451, or you've heard me say NREPA earlier tonight. We are here tonight because Bill Nygren has proposed the following. Construct a boulder revetment for the purpose of shoreline erosion protection, including excavate approximately 42 cubic yards of material below the ordinary high water mark in an area measuring 281 feet long and four feet wide to key in the toe of the revetment. Place an overall total of approximately 1,884 cubic yards of material consisting of mattress stone and armor stone riprap in an area measuring a maximum of 281 feet long, 33 feet wide, and 22 feet high. Of this total, approximately 42 cubic yards of material are proposed below the ordinary high water mark. Access to the site is proposed via barge from Lake Michigan. Restoration of the dune by planting native dune vegetation is proposed upon completion of the revetment as necessary. In order for a permit to be granted, EGLE must find that the proposed activity described in the public notice meets certain criteria set by Part 325, Great Lakes Submerged Land, and Part 353, Sand Dunes Protection and Management of Act 451. Under Part 325, Great Lakes Submerged Lands, EGLE is charged to make the following considerations. Quoting pertinent sections of the administrative rules for Part 325, Rule 15, R322.1015 states, in each application for a permit, lease, deed, or agreement for bottom land, existing and potential adverse environmental effects shall be determined. Approval shall not be granted unless the department has determined both of the following. That the adverse effects to the environment, public trust, and riparian interests of adjacent owners are minimal and will be mitigated to the extent possible. And that there is no feasible and prudent alternative to the applicant's proposed activity, which is consistent with the reasonable requirements of public health, safety, and welfare. Under Part 353, Sand Dunes Protection and Management, EGLE is charged to make the following considerations, quoting pertinent sections of the law. Section 35304, subsection 1G states, subject to section 35316, a permit shall be approved unless the local unit of government or the department determines that the use will significantly damage the public interest on the privately owned land, or if the land is publicly owned, the public interest in the publicly owned land by significant and unreasonable depletion or degradation of any of the following. One, the diversity of the critical dune areas within the local unit of government. Two, the quality of the critical dunes areas within the local unit of government. And three, the functions of the critical dune area within the local unit of government. However, when a special exception approval is necessary, which is the case in this application, then section 35317 subsection one also applies. That section reads similarly, but includes additional language relative to a determination of practical difficulty in assuring human health and safety. The purpose of tonight's hearing is to give anyone interested in the application an opportunity to provide information that EGLE can use in making the decision whether or not to issue a permit. Please recognize that EGLE can only use the information you provide if it relates to the criteria that EGLE must use in making a decision. Some of you may simply want to express your support or opposition to the project. We will happy to make, to make note of your position, but please understand that EGLE is by law not allowed to base our decision on whether or not there is widespread support or opposition to the project. In just a moment, I will outline the procedures we will use for taking your comments. But before I do so, I need to mention that the notice of this hearing was published in the Herald Palladium on June 5th, 2021. To ensure that the hearing is conducted in a fair manner, we will follow these steps. First, we will call the names of those who have indicated that they would like to make a statement. We will call you in the order in which you registered for the hearing. Please remember, EGLE can only use the information you provide if it relates to the criteria we must use in making a decision. If you have questions and there's time at the end, depending on which is more appropriate, we will either allow the applicant to respond or EGLE staff will respond. Second, we will call on those who have indicated during the session that they would like to speak. Finally, when all comments have been completed, we will ask if anyone else would like to make a statement. When your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted. As you begin your comments, please state your name and any group or association you may represent. Each person will be given three minutes to make their comments. We will indicate to you when you have one minute. Please begin wrapping up your comments and end within the allotted time. If need be, we will indicate when your time has ended. If you have written comments or materials that you would like to submit, please email them to me or upload them into my waters or send them to me via US mail to the Kalamazoo District Office. I ask that we will all be courteous and respectful to one another tonight. Only one person should be speaking at a time. Please do not interrupt a speaker and please also recognize that Eagle staff is here tonight to provide a fair opportunity for you to express your comments on the proposed project and to listen to those comments. 
This hearing is being recorded and your comments will be a part of the information Eagle will consider in making its decision on whether or not to issue a permit on the proposed project. The public comment period for this public hearing is open for 10 days from the date of this hearing, ending on July 1st, 2021. Additional information and comments submitted in writing during the 10-day public comment period will also be considered in Eagle's decision. Additional information and comments may be submitted to myself, Zach Chamberlain, at the Kalamazoo District Office, 7953 Adobe Road, Kalamazoo, Michigan, 49009-5025. Following the close of the public comment period, Eagle will make a decision to either issue a permit for the project as proposed or with modifications or send a letter of denial. You may find out what the decision is by checking the Eagle My Waters website. Um, the link is available in one of the other slides that Ryan has. And search for permit number HNZ-0DH7-KT8B0. Thank you for your attention. I will now ask the applicant, to, oh, that, that's wrong, we already did that. Um, so we will begin calling on the names of those who have indicated that they would like to make a statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zach. Yeah, as Zach had mentioned, I have a list of names of people who registered and indicated they wanted to make a statement tonight. So I'll go uh, straight down the list in order of people who registered. I'll identify the first person in line, and then I'll also identify who's up next so that you can, can kind of prepare yourself for, uh, for your statements. You'll have three minutes uh, to provide your statement. Um, I'll give you a one-minute warning. Uh, or one minute heads up rather that you're getting close to your time. And then once we've gotten through this whole list of people who are pre-registered, we'll open it up to anybody else who would like to make a statement. And so if you're not on this list um, and you'd like to make a statement, you just have to raise your virtual hand in Zoom. Um, and if you're on the phone, hit pound two and, and we will call on you. So um, when you, then when you are called upon, uh, your name is called, you can go ahead and make your statement. Um, so the first person I have identified uh, on my list is uh, Donna Graham. So uh, we will unmute you and then you can unmute yourself. You'll be able to unmute yourself and you can make your statements. Hey, Ryan, I don't see a Donna Graham in attendance. Okay. So I want to move on to the next one. All right. Yep, that sounds good. I have uh, 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 Ellen Reagan. And then up after Ellen is Robert Cook. So Ellen Reagan. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Ellen Reagan, a resident of Bridgman, Michigan, and a member of the Lakefront Preservation Group, which is a local citizens group of 445 individuals who came together to try to protect the quality of the beaches and dunes of Southwest Michigan that are currently being threatened by the recent escalation in hard armoring. Thank you, Ego, very much for affording us this opportunity to speak. I will be very brief. The project in question would be built in a designated critical dunes area and thus will have an impact on a natural resource the state has identified as particularly vulnerable. Michigan's stated purpose for creating the critical dune statute was to balance for present and future generations the benefits of protecting, preserving, restoring, and enhancing the diversity, quality, functions, and values of the state's critical dunes with the benefits of economic development and multiple human uses. Accordingly, the state wrote into law that individuals wanting to build a structure lakeward of the dune crest in a critical dune area must apply for a spe special exception permit to do so. We are asking that the special exception be denied in this case. The applicant has already employed temporary sand-filled geotubes, which have protected his property through the winter and spring storms. Even so, he requests that you grant him a special exception to permanently install nearly 300 feet of hard armoring to preemptively safeguard a secondary home that is not in imminent danger. We feel this does not qualify as a practical difficulty under Section 35317 of Part 353 of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, and it would set a dangerous precedent. With lake levels now 21 inches below what they were last year and dropping, it's our opinion that hard armoring, which jeopardizes natural resources by interfering with the diversity, quality, and function of a critical dune area, should not be granted the special exception requested. To quote famed Wisconsin naturalist Aldo Leopold, a thing is right when it tends to promote the integrity, beauty, and stability of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Hard armoring does not promote the integrity, beauty, and stability of the biotic community.
community. You have one minute. Okay, thank you. It is known over time to increase scouring and accelerate downdrift erosion, ultimately degrading beaches, violating the public trust and diminishing biodiversity. That's it. Thank you for your time and your consideration in this really critical matter. Thank you for your comment. And so the next person uh, I have on the list is uh, Robert Cook. And after Robert is Bob Hartman. So uh, Robert, we will unmute you. Okay. It looks like you're unmuted. You can go ahead and start when you're ready. Great, thanks so much. Do you, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. I think you guys are doing a great job um, and uh, also allowing the public to be able to speak uh, regardless of which side they're on or, or what their thoughts are. And so I appreciate that. I'm gonna go with kind of a little bit of a softer approach and just share a little bit about my uh, personal observations and experiences and and what we would request uh, Eagle to consider. Um, one is I grew up in, in Bridgman. I graduated from Bridgman High School in 1982. Um, I spent a lot of time along the lakefront. It was an important uh, part of my life and uh, that of my family. Uh, had many friends in all of the, uh, the Bridgman uh, neighborhoods along the lake, including Wildwood, Woodland Shores, uh, Dunewood. And um, also worked uh, for four years during high school and early in college at Waco Beach. So the point is, I, I've seen the lake levels uh, high and I've seen them low. And, um, and that's just part of nature. Th that cyclical uh, action is going to continue to take place. Uh, in February of 2020, my wife and I moved back um, to the area yeah because uh it had taken you know, my my career had taken me away and uh, i am a degreed engineer so i understand a little bit about the forces and how um a, a permanent structure will um not permanently protect but it will permanently destroy the natural beauty of the lake we walk up and down the lake um anywhere from south of warren dunes to north of wildwood and it's a very unique uh, stretch of beach. And that's one reason why we chose to be back here and to be able to enjoy it along with individuals from all over this community, all over the state, all over the, the Midwest and all over the world really that come here to enjoy this part of the beach. Um, we have uh, recently we toured um, the, the beach. Yeah, one minute left. Sure. Thank you. Recently, we toured the beach up north of uh, Stevensville and uh, Shoreham and St. Joe. And uh, we were just very saddened by the revetments that had been installed in the past and how you could see very clearly, you don't have to be an engineer, you don't have to have a PhD to realize how the downdrift and how those forces transfer to other parts of the beach and destroy it. Um, and then most recently we uh, kayaked along the, the beach along this property that's in question and it seems to me like there is a, a great deal of space, even between the high water mark from this past year and the home. And it sounds like the home is the, the, the most critical structure um, and the closest structure. But in, in summary, we would just ask, in summary, we would just ask that, uh, you know, Eagle consider that, um, that not to approve this hard revetment project and that the ways to consider um, the lake uh, moving up and down would be to have appropriate setbacks, would be to not overbuild a site so that there's plenty of room. And then also, Time is up. okay, great. And, and not to, to overbuild the site and then also have a movable structure if at all needed. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Yep, thank you for your comment. All right, the next person uh, on my list is Bob Hartman. And then after Bob is John Immel. Immel? So Bob, it looks like you're unmuted. You can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you. I understand several people wish to make a comment today. So I'm gonna yield my time back to the next, uh, next commenter. Thank you. All right, we can actually only do three minutes uh, per person. So if you have something you want to say, Bob, feel free. 
That's fine. Uh, yield my time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I've got uh, John up and then uh, John Amell up and then John Kins is after John. John, it looks uh, like you're good unmuted. Evening. You go ahead. Yep. We can hear you. you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. You can hear me okay. Um, good evening. My name is John Immel. As president of the Wildwood Homeowners Association, of which Mr. Nigren is a member, I would like to add to the detailed comments already made in the letter to Eagle regarding this application. Bill Nigren is a good Wildwood neighbor and that, that there is any or this could devolve into neighbor against neighbor is very distasteful here. But I pass on the strong position of our 50 plus property owners that while Mr. Nigren's right to protect his property is highly respected, it cannot come at the expense of the scientifically certain damage a permanent stone revetment would cause to our shared beach. If Mr. Nigren is allowed this hard armoring revetment, it will impact the lakeshore property commonly owned by all Wildwood residents, permanently changing the unencumbered north to south beach access and walking all owners currently enjoy. In addition, sadly diminishing the value of each homeowner's property. Mr. Nigren has already installed a temporary sandbag geotube structure that is serving his protective purposes perfectly. Lake Michigan, as we all know, is receding as expected in the long cycle of nature and actual risk to his property is diminishing daily. At some point in the future, Mr. Nigren will be able to cut open the bags as they were designed to be and return the sand to the beach. New stairs can be built, new vegetation can be planted, a new patio can be built. But if his application is approved and the revetment built, no matter how pretty or how far the rock is imported, there will never be any new beach once the scientifically certain scouring of the shore is done but there will forever be this huge rock wall that simply does not belong. Please take the long view and deny this unnecessary application. The treasured uninterrupted beach running from Livingston on the north yeah, to one minute left. beyond on the south is not only a public trust that must be protected, it is the single most valuable tourist visitor attraction in the area. I don't know if you Thanks heard me, John, but you have less than a minute speak. left. Are you, done? Are you, are you finished, John? I didn't yes, I am. Thank you. you very much for okay. the opportunity to speak tonight. All right. Thank you for your comment. All right. The next person on the list is John <laughs> Kins, followed by Jerry White. John, it looks like you are. Um, unmuted, you can go ahead and make your comment when you're ready. Uh, my name is John Kins, and I live in the Wildwood Association next to and south of Bill Nigren. I sincerely hope the permit to build the proposed boulder revetment is rejected. Here are my concerns if it is not. First and foremost is the erosion that will be caused by the proposed revetment. My property being just south of Bills will take the biggest hit. Studies have shown the damage revetments can do to down drip properties, and I'm certainly down drip. I have already lost some 30 feet of dune because of the last high water and can't afford to lose more. Besides my property, Jerry White, my neighbor to the south, as well as properties in Dunewood, will also realize erosion loss. My second concern is the look of the Wildwood Lakeshore and Beach. The proposed revetment is a massive boulder structure. Just think of the size, 281 feet long, almost the length of a football field, 22 feet high, the height of a two-story building and 33 feet wide. Many of our beaches aren't 33 feet wide. No matter how cleverly this boulder revetment is designed, it will always be extremely unattractive 
and simply doesn't belong on our beautiful beach. The sand revetments aren't attractive, but certainly better than the proposed boulder one, and will do and will do the job, especially with lake waters receding. My concern is the effect on property values. I know yeah, one one minute left, John. Okay, no problem. I know and have been told that the proposed revetment, if built, will negatively affect my property value and potential buyers wouldn't be interested unless there was a significant price discount. Thank you, Eagle, for giving me the opportunity to express my concerns. Yeah, thank you for your comment. I have uh, one more person on my list of pre-registered attendees, and that's Jerry White. Um, and then after Jerry is, uh, is done with his comment, we will move on to anybody else who is on the line today who would like to make your comment. And if that's you, feel free to raise your virtual hand in Zoom uh, and we'll call on you in order. So now, um, Jerry, looks like you're unmuted on our end. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and make a comment. And you should be able, looks like you're still muted. If you go to the oh. Zoom toolbar, oh, there you are. That looks like you're unmuted now. Jerry. Sorry. Um, again, I am Jerry White. I am a Wildwood resident, a longtime Wildwood resident. Um, I have one property, John Kinses separates uh, myself from the property in, in question. And I too am against um, the revetment, the granting of the permit. Um, a couple points. One, obviously, it's going to severely um, be harmful to my property. It's, I haven't read anything that would say that it, it would not be. And like um, other people, I've lost probably 30, 35 feet of dune. I've lost the deck. Um, but I, you know, I've seen the lake go up and down, and I don't think any extraordinary measure is needed right now. Um, I've heard from the person designing it that the house is not in danger. If the house is not in danger and the sandbags that are there now are working, no one said they haven't worked. Um, it, I'm a bit befuddled on why um, a permit would ever be granted, especially a permit that's really an exception that's gonna be around for five years. Um, it should be um, a very specific case. And the case right now is that the house is not in danger. It'd be harmful to the property to the south of it for sure. It would be an eyesore and the sandbags are currently um, functioning. So I, I, you know, for all those reasons, I don't understand why we, the permit would be grounded or why would it be, why would it be needed? If someone came and said that their house was about to fall in or this was really you know, dangerous, that's a different story. But for to, to have the rest of the community and specific homeowners such as myself to be harmed by this um, for no good reason does not make any sense to me and I am against it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. All right, so now we're going to go to people who have their hand raised to uh, make a comment. Uh, and again, if you're on the phone, you can hit pound two on your phone uh, and it'll raise your hand in Zoom and we'll call on you in order. Uh, the first person um, that has their hand raised is Donna Pugh. Uh, Donna, okay. Yep, mm -hmm. we, can, we can hear you. You can go ahead and make your comment when you're ready. Thank you. And is it not possible to have video? To have to provide video for for people to be able to see me and the other speakers. No, there's no video associated. Okay. With this okay. For okay. So I'll be brief. So I, like Jerry, have been in Wildwood with my husband and since the early '90s. Walked the beach a, a whole lot, and we particularly value the continuous beach from Cook to Waco, which I think is, as others have said, is so unique. And so we oppose a revetment anywhere along that stretch. 
especially where it's proposed now, because we believe that science has established that a revetment causes scouring and will lead to elimination of the walkable beach. I mean, um, we've, like, like the speaker before, we've seen it with sadness what's happened in both St. Joe and South Haven where revetments were put in. And now, even though the water level has gone back down in many other places, these places, when we go there, they're, they're still impassable because the revetments were put in and the beach has never had a chance to re replenish. Um, likewise, we believe that much better alternatives, the sandbags should be employed and have been employed and should continue to be employed rather than a revetment. So we urge Eagle to deny the special exception request. Thank you for your comment. All right, the next person with their hand raised uh, is Scott Howard. So Scott, it looks like we have you unmuted. You can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and start your comment. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Scott Howard. I'm an attorney and I'm working with the Wildwood Homeowners Association. Um, and I wanna talk just briefly about uh, the, the statutory provisions that you're working under. Um, you've heard a lot of discussion about the importance of this beach area and um, why, in effect, that the, uh, that the application um, will ultimately potentially destroy the shoreline that the, the applicant seems, seeks to preserve. Um, scientific studies clearly indicate that hard shoreline armoring should only be allowed as a last resort because it permanently destroys the beach and significantly degrades the critical dunes, including the diversity, quality, and function of the critical dune areas. And the statute is set up so that this, this is to be a, uh, is, an issue of last resort. It's called a special exception for a reason. And that is because the applicant uh, is required to establish that they, that he will suffer a practical difficulty uh, before a permit is to issue. Now, we heard tonight from the applicant's consultant that the applicant does not intend to install the revetment at, at all, and that sandbags have been effective in the past year. And I appreciate the candor here uh, that that the applicant may not may not even intend to install a revetment, and that again, geotubes and sandbags um, will not cause the same downdrift ad adverse impacts that revetments do. And they had the uh, added benefit, as as speakers have mentioned, that the sand can be used to replenish beach areas when the water levels drop. Uh, the consultant also indicated that the house is not threatened at this time. The standard in the ordinance or in the statute requires that there has to be a showing that a practical difficulty again will occur, not that it may occur or there may be a problem in the future. And you're guided by these statutory provisions. It's what you need to follow. These yeah, are the one minute that need to be Stop. proven in order to grant a permit. The other, uh, other important portion of, of the permitting requirement is that a special exception cannot be granted under the statute where the proposed use would significantly damage the, damage the public interest through significant unreasonable depletion or degradation of the diversity, quality, and functions of the critical dune areas. You've heard testimony again from, from the residents about exactly this tonight. I won't reiterate that in any detail, but I would just say that uh, in some, EGLE needs to deny this permit um, it, it, because the statutory standards are not met and there's no other, uh, no other result that EGLE can reach. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comment. Thank you for your comments, Scott. So the next person on the list is uh, Sally Bogart. Um, Sally, it looks like you are unmuted on our end. Um, Feel free to make your comment and unmute yourself once um, once you're able to. Oh, looks like you're unmuted now. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I too want to urge Eagle to deny a permit for this proposed revetment. All the reasons have already been stated, but I will just restate that number one, this house is not in jeopardy. Number two, the sandbags in place are proving to be adequate at this time. 
Number three, the known destructive nature of hard armoring to the walkable beach and to the properties to the south. And number four, the fact that we have re receding water levels. There seems to be no reason that I can see for giving a blanket five-year per, um, permit for a revetment that uh, is not needed at this time and can always be applied for in the future if this house is indeed ever in jeopardy. Thank you for this opportunity again to speak and I urge you to deny this application. Thank you for your comment. All right, so uh, next person with their hand raised is Arthur Hahn. Hi, Thanks. thank you very thank you very much. And I wanna reiterate uh, the appreciation. Uh, I'm a Wildwood resident uh, that we have of your taking the time and the diligence with which you're listening to this. Most of my points have been made. The, the, the simple issue is that the geotubes worked for Mr. Nigren. He was good enough to put them in. If over the course of the next five years, they degenerate, he can put new sandbags in at dramatically less expense than the revetment. There simply is no need and he must show a need. Um, the idea of granting a blank check license to put up a hard armoring and not meeting any of the required statutory requirements is just not comprehensible to the group of us in Wildwood. Uh, our feeling was that we were very grateful that he put in the sandbags. If over the next five years, they need to be reinforced, we hope that he does that. But the hard armoring, as has been stated, will hurt his neighbors, hurt the beach, hurt the public trust. He simply has not met his burden. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your comment. All right, does anybody else, would anybody else like to make a comment? We, okay, looks like we have a hand raised. Uh, uh, James uh, Fitzmaurice, uh, James, looks like you're unmuted on our end and you can go ahead and unmute yourself um, and then go ahead and make your comment when you're ready. And you can do that with the toolbar um, on the bottom. I actually, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. You can go ahead and start with your comment. I actually am going to um, have Donna Graham speak. J Donna James, Graham you're very... is sitting next to me and she will speak. Okay, you're, just so you know, your well, audio is our very first broken. Lot in, well, in 1969. Okay, it's probably a bad connection, but can we? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. We can hear you. All right, James, you're you're muted now. Okay, okay. we can hear you now. Why don't you go ahead and uh, and try to get the statement? Okay. At that time, there was. Uh, uh, our beach, while would be was I think we lost him again with the connection. Yeah. I was just going to suggest if the connection is bad that we uh, the problem. We can't, yeah, we can't, can't hear you now. It's going, the, your audio is going in and out. Uh, and I'm assuming, Kyle, you were going to suggest one uh, of the other methods? Yeah, I was just going to uh, uh, cycle through uh, the other methods, which, um, you know, Zach and I are both available by email or phone call even later this week if anybody would like to provide a comment at that time. It looks like we dropped off. I lost them. Yeah. Um, 
So the next person up is David Williams. Hi, um, David Williams. I'm also a um, longish term uh, resident of Wildwood. Um, I'm not sure I have anything completely new to add, but I just would like to reiterate maybe for the second or third time that um, I do believe that um, this permit application should be denied for all of the criteria that are listed in uh, the act. Um, you know, this will definitely impact the public trust by diminishing access to uh, continuously being able to walk the lake shore, which as we've heard is very valuable to so many, um, not only economically, but the people who live here. Um, Long-term impact on the dunes, the quality and the function of the dunes, the bluffs surrounding the neighboring properties, as well as the property that, that, that our homeowners association actually owns together as an association, 2,800 feet by 100 feet parcel of land platted in 1927. Um, that runs the entire length of Wildwood at the um, uh, beachfront. Um, furthermore, demonstrated, I don't believe he's, uh, I believe he has demonstrated that he's um, researched and actually installed um, a prudent alternative, uh, i.e. the sandbags. Um, so it, it's unclear. I would just uh, um, underscore what uh, Arthur was saying in terms of um, it, th there's already a solution and it's a, a solution that can be turned to again and again. There's no need to put um, hard armoring in. Um, and then um, the other criteria of, of a lack of a need. Um, in fact, we uh, about nine days ago, two of, two, myself and two other people went and um, took Susanna's drawing uh, and scale from the toe, assuming the toe of the revetment is about where the toe of the sandbags are now. Um, we estimate that the beach has added about 35 to 50 feet from the measurements that were in the uh, application filing uh, from December of 2019. So, um, and that's really only come back since November. So it's really um, uh, not really uh, imminent that uh, this revetment would need to be installed. And then I guess the last point isn't really a point of uh, uh, one of your criterions, but we just, um, I, I would just ask you to be consistent with the recent uh, Doomwood rulings, since this is a very similar situation. Um, in fact, yeah, one maybe minute, less... David, just a heads up. Yep, okay. Um, you know, the, it, it should be a consistent ruling. I mean, it's the, there's maybe even less of a need here than some of the other cases, but I really feel like um, it should be consistent. Uh, thanks for your time, and that's I'll conclude. Thank you for your comment. Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment at this point? I don't have any other hands raised right now. If you're on the phone, again, you can press uh, pound two to raise your virtual hand, um, or you can use the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand. Um, and then we can call on you if you want to make a comment. But at this time, it doesn't appear I have any other hands raised. So we will go ahead and uh, conclude the public hearing portion. And uh, Zach, I'd like to invite you to give the closing statement for tonight's hearing. Thanks, Ryan. All right, so thank you all for your comments and cooperation. We appreciate your interest in the proposed project and that you took the time to be here tonight. As indicated at the beginning of the hearing, you may submit additional written comments until July 1st, 2021. Following the close of the public comment period, we will consider all comments received and make a decision on the proposed project. Just to remind you, um, those that may still want to submit a comment, um, comments can be submitted via My Waters, email, or US mail. The hearing is now closed. Thank you again. And um, I believe if um, Ryan progresses the slide, it'll show the waste made a comment one more time. If anyone yep. has a job. Uh, that, that's gonna, gonna be up next. So this will be the other ways to select or to submit an official comment that Zach just mentioned by my waters, um, by email. And I'll read that off again to, to Zach Chamberlain at C-H-A-M-B-E-R 
linz at michigan.gov uh, or by mail. And it also looks like uh, Zach's email is in the chat and the uh, mailing address is also in the chat of uh, tonight's um, webinar or um, public hearing. Uh, the mailing address is Eagle Water Resources Division, Kalamazoo District Office at 7953 Adobe Road, Kalamazoo, Michigan 49009. And as Zach mentioned, the uh, comment period is open for 10 days, which is July 1st. And if you have additional questions, uh, you can contact Zach. Uh, and here is his contact inform information that you'll see on the screen. His phone number is 269-716-4894. Um, and the same email address if you have uh, for the question, questions is C-H-A-M-B-E-R-L-I-N-Z at michigan.gov. That's Michigan spelled out. Um, Kyle, uh, just uh, would see if you wanted to uh, make any final comments for tonight. Uh, no, just thank everybody for uh, participating. We, we always appreciate the, uh, the participation and uh, big showing. All right, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thanks to everyone for uh, all the questions and for our um, panelists um, and the hearings officer today for answering the questions uh, and signing in today. So with that, I hope everyone has a great evening um, and have a good night. <laughs>